in the second video of our Fact or Facade series to establish which house actually does have the longest facade in Britain, we visit a Scottish house with an amazing history. And even if you've never visited the house, you may have seen it being used as a TV filming location in productions such as Outlander and Belgravia. Hopeton House was created in two parts by two of Scotland's leading architects, William Bruce and William Adam. It's an incredibly rare survivor, and it's still lived in today by descendants of the family that built it. Like Stowe and Wentworth Woodhouse, there are two impressive frontages. The west front, designed by William Bruce just before 1700, had begun to look a little dated by the 1720s, and the house itself was proving to be too small for the needs of the Earl and his family. William Adam was selected to transform the Bruce house into the structure we see today, including the magnificent east front. When he died in 1748, his sons John, James and Robert Adam were retained by the Earl to complete their father's work and as a result, both inside and out, Hopeton is an architectural marvel. If the 18th and 19th centuries were the unchallenged glory days of the great country house, the changing social, political and economic landscapes in the 20th century created a world in which many simply didn't survive. Across the UK, thousands of country houses were demolished, stripped of their fittings and left as empty shells or simply dynamited. The larger the house, the greater the risk of it being seen as a white elephant by its owners, so the fact that Hopeton survived is a real testament to the vision of the family who lived there. So talking about the scale of loss of country houses from across Scotland, some estimates have it as over 500 country houses that have been lost. And we lost a lot, particularly in the second half of the 20th century, after the Second World War. Society was changing uh, and economics were changing. Uh, and indeed, the way people were living was changing. And a lot of country houses simply weren't able to adapt to changing ways of lives. Uh, a notable example might be, for example, Hamilton Palace, which was arguably one of the most spectacular and grandest country houses, not just in Scotland, but in the whole of the United Kingdom. It was a vast structure that had been enormously enlarged. It had its roots in the 17th and 18th centuries, but very much enlarged at the beginning of the 19th century as well. But even by the 1870s, uh, the family had decided it was just not suitable for, for what was then modern life, and they chose to live elsewhere. So. What we then found is that the house became empty and disused. And when a request came in to uh, mine coal from underneath Hamilton Palace, the family was only too happy. Now, of course, what we then saw what happened in 1919 is that literally it was undermined. Its foundations were undermined by this coal mining activity and it became unstable and it had to be demolished. A part of the archive that we have at Historic Environment Scotland is the Charles Brand archive that actually, uh, this was a, a, a firm that um, was set up, uh, uh, its primary income was demolishing country houses. And you can imagine that um, in the post-war years, they were uh, very busy. And as part of their corporate archives, they were taking photographs of the demolition um, of these country houses. That is something that's very difficult as an architectural historian to, to look at. Uh, one of the really interesting things about Hopeton House for me is that uh, in 1974, the management and ownership of, of, of the house uh, transferred to a preservation trust, which was actually one of the earliest of its kind. And this reflects what was happening in the wider historic environment in the 1970s, when we began to understand that actually maybe demolishing your country houses wasn't such a good thing after all and maybe we could preserve them and find a new use for them and give them new life. And I think that's one of the most interesting things that happened in the 20th century. The country house moved from being a, a, a very private 
and sort of insular uh, function to a much well, sort of quasi-public function in many ways. Today, for many country houses, the way they survive and are sustained uh, is through uh, commercial activity. So it's it being open to the public and allowing members of the paying public to come in and, and enjoy the building and, and buy a gift book and, and a, buy scone and a cup of tea. And that's all really, really important, not just for the people who are enjoying that, but for the house itself as well, because it sustains it economically. It provides more jobs in the wider economy as well, um, but it keeps the lights on, uh, it keeps the building warm and dry, and it keeps the roof fixed as well. And it's not an easy job to keep a building like this going. For over 70 years, Hopeton House has been a visitor attraction, a place of business and a community providing employment, involvement, volunteering opportunities, and much more to a wide range of people. Unlike the other houses we're featuring, Hopeton House is the only one of our three contenders which is still lived in by descendants of the family that built it. My name's Andrew Hopeton. I'm the Earl of Hopeton and with my wife and children I'm lucky enough to live in the same house that my family built over 300 years ago. The house was built between about 1699 and 1750 and it works surprisingly well still as a family home combined with a visitor attraction, a tourist destination, a destination for events and weddings and the like, and for much larger events like our electronic music festival and our fireworks night and the Christmas fair. That balance between the house as a home, the house as a museum, and the house as a place for activities and entertainment is not always an easy one to strike, but it is an extraordinary privilege to be able to live in this house. It's a wonderful house. During the recent pandemic, when it was locked down, it was just my wife and me and the children with a couple of our team members who weren't furloughed looking after this whole thing. And it reminded me how much work everybody has to put into it. And actually, what a wonderful thing is the result. Hopeton is a house that is undoubtedly historically significant, as so many of these houses are. And it does hold, I think, a special place for its community and for Scotland more generally. We're incredibly lucky with the team that we have here and the volunteers that we have here. And one of the reasons that we have been able to engage with them and to keep them involved with us, in some cases for 40, 45 years, is because this house has the most magical feel about it. And that is something that it's very, very hard to put into words. Uh, the late Duchess of Devonshire once said about this house that the colonnades were like arms throwing themselves out to you in welcome as you arrived. And I do believe very strongly that this house has a feel about it and that feel is a happy feel. Living and working in a house like this does present some very obvious challenges. The biggest and perhaps the clearest one is the upkeep that a place like this takes. Fundamentally though, the house needs to generate the revenues to allow us to invest in it in the way that we would like to to future-proof it. I look at the future very positively and I am confident for the future of Hopeton. We have managed to get through the last few hundred years and I would like to think that we will have a place and a role and an activity here for the next few hundred. I would love to think it remains a home. Uh, that is by no means guaranteed. There are so many of these houses like Stowe and Wentworth that are no longer lived in. But whatever happens to it, I hope that it does have a future because it's a place that is incredibly important to me and to my family in the widest possible sense. And it's one that we're very, very privileged to be involved with.
Lord Hopeton brought together an incredible team of over 100 staff, volunteers, family members, visitors and local cadets, all keen to lend their support to Hopeton's claim to the longest facade title. To cover the entire west front of Hopeton House in a straight line, we'd need more than 300 people. Tony Barton set out with his trundle wheel to measure the west front and he received some help along the way. He shares his findings in confidence with Lord Hopeton. Well, that's the second house measured up and in the final instalment of this video series, we'll be able to reveal which house actually does have the longest facade of any country house in Britain. Join us next time at what's been called the greatest restoration project of a generation. And yes, you've guessed it, the third contender is Wentworth Woodhouse itself. <laughs>